Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you do you struggle with a lack of focus or energy the team at physician designed knows the feeling and they can help brain support micro pqq and microactive coq10 both use a proprietary blend of pqq and coq10 to maximize the boost you need without any negative side effects Studies show that brain support micro PQQ and microactive CoQ10 lower fatigue, anxiety, and depression while increasing mental acuity and awareness. Feel the difference for yourself today. You can save 30% on your next order at physiciandesigned.com. Just use the code GENIUS during checkout. Again, that's GENIUS to get 30% off at physiciandesigned.com. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Byron Johnson. He's a distinguished professor of social sciences at Baylor University. And the topic we're going to talk about today is uh, more God, less crime, and objective religion. So, Byron, thanks for coming. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your background and uh, what, what kind of work you're doing today in this moment once you go through the history. Sure. I'm trained as a criminologist, and I've been doing criminology research for 35 years, I guess, now. But over over time, instead of narrowing the expertise, which is what typically happens these days. You kind of carve out a little niche <clears throat> that you know quite a bit about and you focus on that and you don't know much about everything else. But I was trained as a criminologist and slowly but surely over the years have tackled a number of issues outside of criminology. And so my interests have expanded. And just a, an example of that is our current most recent project is on human flourishing. And um, so it's a global study of looking. Oh, that, that's a crime in itself. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, looking at physical health, mental health, well-being, and uh, the role that religion plays in helping people and societies to flourish. So just oh, a, li a little different than the kinds of things that I was initially trained to do. Well, if, you know, I don't want to make it all about criminology, certainly, but um, just I've never spoken to a criminologist. So um mm -hmm. What are the main uh, specialties yeah. or sub areas of criminology, and yeah. and what were you know what were some experiences in it that shaped you to? Sure. Yeah. yeah, criminology has a bunch of sub subfields, and so some people are interested in economics and how um, those issues related to the economy influence crime. So, for example, poverty, unemployment. There are so many poor people, and most people that are incarcerated just happen to be poor. Um, but most poor people don't commit crime. So it gets rather complicated. Some people study the family. Some people study, you know, age, because age is a predictor. And uh, other people look at a host of other kinds of things that are re related to the likelihood of com committing criminal acts or deviant acts. And um, but I... I kind of was interested in pursuing it from just a different angle, not looking at how can we predict the likelihood that you yourself would commit an illegal act or that you would be the victim of an illegal act. How about looking at the opposite side of that coin? Why is it 
that the vast majority of the population is law abiding? Why do they do the right thing most of the time instead of looking at the very, very small percentage of people that actually break the laws in society? What can we learn if we look at the opposite, what I would call pro-social behavior? So it's not only why do I, why am I law abiding, but why do I do acts of kindness? Why do I serve others? Why am I generous? But some, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm always interested in percentages because it's just like a useful guide rail. So what, mm-hmm. what percentages would you say? I, I've heard it divided into three. Okay. People that are just irretrievably messed up and they're just, you know, the, the criminal life is what they embrace and what they do. And then there's people that are, you know, like you say in the middle or, you know, they'll, they usually live well. They usually do the right thing, I guess, under the wrong pressures or circumstances, they will mm-hmm. give in to crime. Mm-hmm. And then there's probably a small group that, you know, almost to their death, they, they won't break the law. They won't commit a crime. Yeah. What, what have you seen? Yeah. It, it's not anything like that. Um, so it's about like 95% obey the law all the time. So for all the, all the panic that we hear, and that I'm not making light of spikes in violent crime or things like that, because we have seen some spikes recently, especially in major urban centers. But the likelihood of criminal acts happening is something that's relegated to just a very, very small percentage of the population. So it's not so much three categories as two categories. And, and of the category that are people that break the law, most of the law is broken by just a very small percentage of that group. Oh, okay. So what, what, what would you guess? Like what, what percent of society uh, commits yeah. significant crimes instead of real low level ones? Less than 1%. Oh, wow. Okay. That's good. That's very good mm-hmm. to know. Yeah. But you know, no one turns on the news at night to see that here's a guy that actually mentors young kids. And this is a person who gives to the poor and this this person helped this old lady cross the street but people would rather hear that someone clubs someone to death for no reason at all and that might get picked up by everybody and then it gets a huge life of its own and so we just have a tendency to emphasize the ugly and not emphasize all the good that's going on so for example americans give about a billion dollars a day to charities wow uh, really yeah, yeah, about four hundred and fifty billion dollars a day people give, and the and the lion's share of that is faith motivated giving. Do you ever hear about this? Of course not. It's not newsworthy. It should be. No one wants to hear that Americans are gener are generous. Americans don't want to hear it, and other people across the world certainly don't want to hear it. But that's the fact, and it's phenomenal. I'm not trying to make a rosier picture, but I just think so much of what we know is distorted greatly. And it's unfortunate. So a lot of the work that we do is kind of repairing the damage about stereotypes that people have uh, on all numbers of issues. So for example, uh, religious people are bigots. Uh, they're closed-minded. They, they, they're they inward looking. It, it's all completely fa- false. Uh, people of faith are the most open-minded. They're least prejudiced. And so again, I think there's a stereotype of what things look like, and most of the stereotypes that we have in the media are wrong. Do you struggle with a lack of focus or energy? The team at Physician Designed knows the feeling, and they can help. Brain Support Micro PQQ and Microactive CoQ10 both use a proprietary blend of PQQ and CoQ10 to maximize the boost you need without any negative side effects. Studies show that Brain Support Micro PQQ and Microactive CoQ10 lower fatigue, anxiety, and depression, while increasing mental acuity and awareness. Feel the difference for yourself today. You can save 30% on your next order at physiciandesigned.com. Just use the code GENIUS during checkout. Again, that's GENIUS to get 30% off at physiciandesigned.com. Yeah, I I would say, I guess, just, just my own personal experience, I think the numbers in terms of religious people probably follow the same numbers in regular society. You know, so I've been, I remember being little and coming out of church and, uh, you know, a Christian church and the family I was with started complaining about some of the other families there, that they were black and they shouldn't be there. Mm. And I thought, what the, what the heck? Um, you know, but most people of faith that I've met are good people. 
Sure. So I would guess that again, it's a small minority. Yep. There's probably what's been picked up on and amplified and made to look like the whole group, well, which but, happens a lot. Yeah. Uh, there's a paper that was published last year I thought was very interesting because you hear a lot of people say, you know, you've got Christian nationalism. It's running amok. Look at all these people that voted for Trump, especially these evangelicals. It's just what we thought. They can't be trusted. This study that that I can send to you documents scientifically that it's the unchurched, quote unquote, Christians that overwhelmingly voted for Trump. And it doesn't mean that religious or church people didn't also vote for Trump. But when it comes to questions dealing with nationalism, it's clearly an unchurched versus a churched breakdown. But what you hear is just the opposite, where they try to paint all religious people, especially evangelicals, with one brush. And that is a but a brush of bigotry. Again, completely false. If you look at who's doing all the volunteer work in America, who's providing homes and caring for the homeless, it's faith-based groups. It's always been this way, and but it goes completely unrecognized. And so the kind of work that we do, we study the role that religion plays in taking people who have erred, people who have become addicted to drugs. Can, can religion help get them off of drugs and help them remain sober? The answer is, by the way, a big fat yes. And can people who are incarcerated, who've done terrible things, can they turn their lives around? And can they get a new identity to replace this old, ugly identity? And the answer is yes. These, these are not assumptions that we're making. These are the result of tons, scores and scores and hundreds of empirical studies. So a couple of questions here. When, when you were a criminologist only, were you secular or were you a faith or did you come to faith through being a criminologist? Like, what was your story, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, no, no, no. I, you know, I was raised in a very devout home. So I was, I've always been a, a very serious Christian. And, you know, when I went to graduate school, uh, that persisted. Most of my professors uh, back in the mid 80s were Marxist. At that time, Marxism was still very, very popular on campuses. And so they were all kind of fascinated with the fact someone like me, a person of faith, would be in, in this field dominated by people that are not just secular, they're hostile to religion. And so that's what I faced. So if you want to, see who's prejudiced. You know, I've written about this. I have a chapter in a book about the last acceptable prejudice is prejudice against Christians. There are probably a few more out there. But as they say at Harvard, you can be anything but an outspoken Christian. And so when I was studying for my PhD, I thought I, I would love to study religion as a subfield. And my, my advisor said that would be a disaster. A, there's nothing out there. So so why would you really want to jeopardize your career? And I said, well, one of the things I've learned in graduate school is if, if there's a topic that may be important and people are not looking at it, as a trained social scientist, why wouldn't we want to, to give it the benefit of the doubt and take a look and see where the science takes us? And, and the response was, you know, that, that does make good sense. That, that is, in fact, how you were trained. So if you want to wreck your career, go ahead and study the role of religion. That, so that was over 30 years ago, and now religion is itself a major subfield within criminology. And I've kind of been the, the, one of the father figures of that whole movement. Really? Religion is a major subfield? Wow. Oh, yeah. How is, so, it, how is it interplay with criminology? It predicts who gets in trouble and who doesn't, for one. It, it, so if you're raised in the, in the housing projects and you're a male – and you're young, and you happen to be a person of color, guess what? You're at high risk for criminal behavior. But if you have all those characteristics, and you are raised within a religious family, and you're embedded within a faith community, it changes that outcome dramatically. So just just the intervention of being raised within a faith community is, is incredibly protective. So religion is a protective factor, not only for who gets into trouble and who doesn't, but for who uses drugs and alcohol to excess. It's a protective factor for marriages. The list goes on and on. It's a protective factor against divorce. 
And so religion is really one of the more powerful variables out there. So we know this in a whole bunch of fields, including medicine, that now we've come to appreciate it's the case in criminology. And so next week I'm going to Atlanta where the, the national meetings will be held. And I'm, I'm doing an author meets critic on our most recent book called The Restorative Prison. But I'll be just one of many, many sessions where 5,000 criminologists come and talk about everything you can imagine. But religion will be one of those areas. Okay. Well, um, so it's predictive of whether people will fall into criminality. But um, once people do, of the people that commit crimes, you know, large and small, how does uh, faith interact with them after they commit the crime and now they have to deal with the justice system? Like, what have yeah. you observed there? Yeah, for a lot of them, they they wind up incarcerated, and then there are a host of ministries that are are dedicated to helping people that are in prison. And so it's not like they just come in and do Bible studies, although clearly they do that. And we have done research on Bible studies, and we find that Bible studies are really protective. I mean, they help they help guys get a new identity. They help them give their lives away in service to others. We even studied inmates in a prison in Louisiana called Angola, largely recognized as the worst prison in America. Corruption run rampant, violence rampant, and everybody's serving life just about in the entire prison with over 6,000 prisoners. And they started a Bible college there in 1995 that completely changed the prison. And so we've written at length about this, not only in a big book, but also many papers, showing that these guys who have no hope of getting out of prison actually become completely different people, and they do these incredible acts of service for others that are also serving life. And so- Really? Like, for, oh, like, like what? Like what acts of well, like counseling. A lot of guys are dying in prison because they're not getting out. And so when we were doing the study, about three inmates a month would die, and the inmates do the funerals. And so they, And then when their loved ones on the outside die, and they can't even be there for the funeral, these other inmates minister to the inmates who are grieving. Oh, okay. um, they also provide counseling to inmates that are getting ready to be killed uh, because they have the, the death penalty in place in Louisiana. And so these guys actually tithe. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of tithing, but this is where people actually give a percentage of their income back to the church. These inmates tithe. The inmates tithe? The inmates Making tithe. Of, what, what, they make a dollar a day or something? No, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's pennies that they make, but they, they can receive money from a family member and it's deposited into an account so that they can buy certain kinds of things from the commissary in a prison. And what little they have, they tithe to these inmate-led congregations. And so, you know, when you study these people over, over time, like we have for, for years, you, you come to find that these changes are authentic and that inmate on inmate violence is drastically reduced, inmate on staff violence reduced, suicides almost non-existent. And so it's this, instead of thinking as pr of prisoners as liabilities that must be managed, how about thinking of prisoners as assets that need to be cultivated to improve our prisons? So most of my secular colleagues would say that the answer for our current prison crisis is to let everyone out or even better destroy the prisons because they're so they're so bad and i would say that the answer for our prisons lies within our prisons it's the inmates themselves inmates that that find god find hope find meaning and purpose that they never had outside I've, I've been told by hundreds and hundreds of inmates, I hate that I did all those things, but at least now I can admit I did them. I'm glad I'm here because my, I got my life back. I found my life here, and now I want to help others. And so there are many inmates that would say, and I think that they're right, you know, we want to help people on the outside who don't have the peace and contentment that we do. Because as you probably know, Rich, suicide, depression, anxiety, uh, what we call deaths of despair. Suicides right. and overdose deaths are at record highs and have been increasing every year now for some time. Yeah. And so you could argue that people that live in the free world like you and me are more confined than our prisoners who are behind four walls. And so for many of them, they have found a freedom that if you go in and you watch, 
you have, you, you, you know, you, you can see it, you can feel it, and then we can actually measure it. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Well, I know, you know, a, a few, to, you know, a few friends. Uh, one of them, the the church did like a, a ceremony, a ceremony, sorry, a seminar on how to have a better marriage. Um, you know, I've seen ones on how to, you know, how to raise children and difficult children, et cetera. So I've seen that as many faith based organizations that have really provided great, great coursework and great to people. So yeah. that goes what you're saying. Yeah, except it's from the least likely place. So, you know, so I've heard prisoners tell me for decades, the next great awakening is coming from the prisons, not not from another Billy Graham, but from the prisons themselves. And that's why for some of these prisoners uh, that used they used to have so many volunteers that go in, which they still do. And it's great to have volunteers. But in some of these prisons where the inmates are so active and they've now gone to seminary and they've become what they call field ministers, these guys lead congregations, they lead worship in the prisons themselves, um, and they're so much more powerful than people coming in from the outside. And, and so it's, it's just like what we've learned in missions in general. Uh, it's great to do missionary work, but once people that are indigenous are trained, they're much more effective than people from other places. And I think that this is what we're finding in prisons and we're finding it in drug treatment programs too after all if you were an addict who do you think would be better to help you with your sobriety someone who's never experimented with drugs and don't know what they are or someone who used to be an addict and has gone through the same things that you have but now they've been sober for 20 years yeah no, it makes sense um what, what about the criminal justice system itself are there any mm-hmm. faith-based police groups or judges or prosecutors or is that yes. invisible and you'll never see it? It's all there, but it's under the radar. So there are tons of faith-based programs. Every church that I've ever attended has people that are doing volunteer work within the criminal justice system. And so the, the most recent book that I'll be responding to at the criminology meetings next week is called The Restorative Prison. And it basically documents how faith is transforming prisons but with faith-based solutions, not government solutions. Not that the government can't be a great and active participant, but that faith really is, and this kind of goes back to the founding of jails and prisons in America. Faith was a part then, and it's going to be a part, and it always has been a part of our system, but now we have empirical data to, to demonstrate just exactly how it can be effective and how it could be replicated. And in fact, we're doing studies now in other parts of the world, and we're finding the same thing. Well, what happens when, uh, you know, you'll have, uh, again, like a judge or there are people involved in a criminal case, you know, at least some of them are of faith. What's the difference in outcomes? I know it depends on the case, but still. Yeah, I think I think it depends on the case. But one of the things I have seen is that judges feel like they have precious few options available to them. Sometimes this person has done something that's illegal. It needs to be punished. They know sending this person to prison is a bit harsh. They would rather not. But they know if they put them on probation and there's no oversight, which unfortunately happens in so many cases, that these people aren't going to be monitored and supervised in a way that they need to be. So what would be another option? Well, they don't have one, probation or incarceration. And so for years, criminologists have been trying to come up with an an array of options that are in between prison and in between probation. You know, you've heard of some of these like boot camps that were, they were a utter disaster. All the data pretty much indicated that. And so what we're finding is that these faith-based or faith-motivated programs for prisoner reentry and for vocational and educational kinds of programs within prison have been found to be effective. And so what, we, what we're arguing for is that the government should be open to these kinds of programs and not try to hinder them, but allow them to flourish. Because after all, the government is interested in a safer society, and a safer society is one where an offender truly is re- rehabilitated when they come back into the society. And most of them are coming back. So I think for a lot of people, they would say, yes, anything that would help these guys get better, I'm for it. And um, so that's the kind of work that that we've been doing. And it's kind of now connecting to this new work that we're doing on flourishing because 
what we would argue is that inmates who can turn their lives around are just perfect examples of what it means to flourish. Hmm. How effective have been the you know, some probationary programs, et cetera, that, again, have a faith component to them versus not. And yeah, are they prevalent? Mm-hmm. Are they very rare? No, they're not. They're not prevalent at all. So because probation is a, a government program. So you work for the you work for the state of New York or you work for the state of New Jersey. Let's you're a parole officer or a probation officer. They're not hiring you to run a faith based program, but. There are faith-based programs within most communities that probation officers and parole officers could clearly recommend that one of their clients could participate in them. The key, and this is where it gets tricky, I'm a judge. I can't sentence you to a faith-based program. Why? Because it needs to be voluntary. So what I could do is I say, here's here's a program. You have obviously have an alcohol issue. You can go to this program. It's a secular program that deals with substance abuse, or this is one run by the Salvation Army. You you pick the Salvation Army one. Oh, by the way, that one is faith-based. And one of the key elements of that particular program is belief in Jesus. So it, it, it gets a little bit tricky because you can't mandate or sentence someone to have some kind of a spiritual experience and but at the same time you can't prevent them from having it should they choose to participate in it so that's where it gets a little bit dicey on some of these things and i think we just have to be innovative and so if you're homeless no one's going to say you can come into our gospel rescue mission home but you have to sign a statement of faith before you're going to get any kind of care no, they don't do that. They let you participate in the program. It's faith-based. They do it because they're trying to answer a mission, a call in their life. And if you say, I'm really struggling in these areas, and I wouldn't mind it if someone prayed for me, well, they're going to be happy to pray for you. So I know we're throwing a lot out here, Rich, at one time, but it does get a little complicated. But I'm just thinking that you know, if we're really interested in outcomes and evidence-based approaches, Religion is proving itself to be a pretty viable option. No, oh, that's great. Um, what you know, I'm just here to ask questions and stuff. So uh, maybe a tough one is, what percentage of people do you think say, uh, I'll, "I'll just do the faith-based one because it looks better," and I don't believe in any of this junk, but I'll uh, uh-huh. I'll just do it. And which what percentage do it because they're mm-hmm. either you know they feel like there's no other option to them, or they actually want to do it. Like, do you have any idea yeah. of this break? Well, I don't have a. a you know, percentage, but I've seen it. I've seen it my whole career where I'm interviewing a guy who's been in a program for three years. And I said, you know, look, you've been in the program for three years. What what led you to the program? Well, you, he said, you know, I can be honest with you now. I entered this program because the program is in Houston in this particular prison. And I, I was out in West Texas and I heard about this program. So I signed up. I knew it was faith-based, but I just wanted to be near my family. I, I was tired of being 900 miles away. Oh, okay. But what happened in the program was that after about a year, some of this stuff that I was hearing be- began to affect me. And so, you know, I've changed as a result of the program itself. And, and so you see this quite commonly where they sign up for the wrong reasons, but the program actually helps them. And so I think that that I mean, I don't know what kind of a percentage. I just seen it a lot. But of course, in cynical minds, people think they all sign up for the wrong reason. It's just not true. But I, clearly, some people will do it because they think it may help them. What they don't know is it could also hurt them in that there may be correctional administrators, correctional staff that are quite cynical. And when people sign up for these programs, they're already assuming that they're doing it for the wrong reason which they shouldn't do that either, but that that does happen. And so they think that these guys are using it as a crutch. It goes both ways. Okay. How long after someone gets into a program, whether they get in for, you know, quote unquote, right or wrong reason, yeah, does it start to change them and work on them? Yeah. Some, some of them can happen immediately and others, it may take a little while. Some of these programs are months in length. Some of them are longer. The, I, the one that I studied in Texas for a while was a two year long program because they wanted to make sure that people completed the program and went through every step of the program. 
but I've studied programs. Uh, we did a study a couple of years ago in Richmond, Virginia, in a jail, not a prison, and the average length of stay was only a month. So these guys participated in a faith-based program that lasted one week. And for a significant number of them, that one week was very, very powerful in terms of rehabilitation, you know, pro-social behavior and a number of other indicators that we would monitor. So for some of them, it can happen very, very quickly. They're all different. And for some, religion isn't going to work at all. But for a good bit, it does because religion is so pervasive in society. Even though we're a very secular society, the you know, 95% of the population believes in God. I think that might come as a shock to some of your listeners because they think atheism is just like going through the roof. Atheism in America is standing around 4% where it's been for over seven decades. Yeah, because I, I, that's what I've heard a lot lately. You know, who knows sources if it's nefarious, but yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know. I guess multiple sources I've seen say that uh, the number of people that or a faith is going way down. The number of people that yep. go to church is going way down. What What do you actually see? It's uh, it's all bogus. Oh, do you, do you see the numbers like unchanged or going yeah, up? Yeah, the, the the numbers are they changing at all? They're very stable and they've been stable for decades. There's a slight decline in church attendance, but when you ask people questions about prayer and you ask people questions about belief, the only place where we see some significant movement is in the youngest. Um, age category. But, you know, and as people get older, of course, they become more and more religious. So there is a narrative, and I've written, I wrote a, a study on this that was published this year, and then I wrote an op ed for the Wall Street Journal on this very topic. The media wants a narrative out there that religion is going away, that God is dead, and that that we're going to become increasingly secular as we realize that there is no need for faith. It's a narrative that people want. It's just never going to happen, and there's no hint that it will happen. And so, yes, attendance may be down, but, you know, if you look at uh, the pandemic, that drove ten attendance down, but what it also do did was to kickstart an electronic revolution within houses of worship. So now that all these houses of worship are online, and, and so you have people like my in-laws who not only watch television and, and church services, they watch about five different congregations instead of the one where they attend. Thank you, pandemic. And so in many ways, if you look at, uh, talk to people at Facebook, they'll tell you one of the biggest drivers on the internet is religious broadcast and religious services. So there are Bible- They'll also tell you that, uh, you know, they shut your account down a lot yeah. of times too. Yeah, and and so I, I think at times I, we're, we're, we're led to believe the wrong things, and people think if you hear it long enough, you'll believe it, just like you were saying that, you know, America is a faithless place. Yeah, but about 95% believe in God, but it's becoming faithless. So where are all the studies indicating atheism is on the rise? They don't exist. We've got studies proving just the opposite, but yet this narrative is so powerful because the media, I think, wants to tell a certain slant in their story making about faith in America. I guess just to, to make a bad joke, people are putting their faith in the, in the narrative that uh, faith is going away. Yeah, that's about right. That's right. So all that you've learned, what, um, how do you put it into practice to better, you know, the, the treatment of prisoners or better their outcomes? I mean, what, what kind of programs have you come up yeah. with or helped foster? Yeah, w yeah, we just we evaluate programs all the time, and if these programs are effective, you know, in everything we do, we publish. So maybe I can give people an address where they can go and just read this stuff for themselves. All of our sure. all of our all of our studies are published and they're there. So it's um, www.baylor b a y l o r ISR, BaylorISR.org. And if they go there, they'll just click on me. I, I, I founded the Institute back in 2004. It's the Institute for Studies of Religion. And if they click on my face, they'll see another area where they can click on studies and so all our publications. And so we, we're continually uploading the website so people can download these publications for free. And, you know, 
these, these, we don't just make accusations. All of our stuff is published in scientific journals and, and adding to that is the fact that most of these journals, of course, not, well, actually almost all of them are completely secular. And so for us to publish studies on religion in a secular journal that's reviewed by academics is, is not something that's easily done. And so the yeah. data, the data are clearly powerful, and that's why we keep getting our stuff published. Yeah. One last question. It's probably going to sound out of turn, but um, it just popped in my head. What What does the um, the prison population or the people you work with have to tell us about why they're suffering in the world? And I know that's a huge question. You know, why does God allow suffering, or why is there suffering? Do they have a better answer because of their experience in life? I, you know. I don't know. Um, I, I, I wish you had a couple of inmate ministers right now, Rich, on the call to see how they would answer that question. But I think most of them would say we live in a broken world. And, you know, a lot of this pain and suffering that happens certainly isn't pain and suffering that God has caused. It's pain and suffering that people have caused. And, you know, it's like blaming God for the fact that we, we have pollution. We don't deny we have it. We have it. Uh, no one's happy about it that I know of, but th- you know, this is what happens. And so, but what if there's a way in which people motivated out of a, a particular calling can bring relief of that pain and suffering that people experience? I see it every day. What if they can do that? Can they make the world a better place? I certainly think that they can. That's obviously what we're hoping to do with the global flourishing study is recognizing that a lot of people are not doing well. And what can you do about it? Well, one of the things we want to find out is what determines how people flourish and, and why are some people not flourishing? And I think the findings from this global study will be very revealing, but I think we already know that, you know, money doesn't make people flourish and happiness is not the, is not equal to flourishing. There are plenty of people that in the midst of their own suffering or their own illness, would indicate that they have a peace and contentment that they can't otherwise explain except for the fact that they have a belief in a higher power and that they would say themselves that they're, they are flourishing. So I think that some of the poorest people in the world may actually help us to understand flourishing a little bit better than we do now because it's a, it's a kind of a complicated issue. It affects all aspects of one's life. Hmm. Well, very good, Byron. You know, it's been a great call and, uh, I really appreciate you being on this podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Take care, my friend. Do you struggle with a lack of focus or energy? The team at Physician Designed knows the feeling, and they can help. Brain Support Micro PQQ and Microactive CoQ10 both use a proprietary blend of PQQ and CoQ10 to maximize the boost you need without any negative side effects. Studies show that Brain Support Micro PQQ and Microactive CoQ10 lower fatigue, anxiety, and depression, while increasing mental acuity and awareness. Feel the difference for yourself today. You can save 30% on your next order at physiciandesigned.com. Just use the code GENIUS during checkout. Again, that's GENIUS to get 30% off at physiciandesigned.com. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.